everyone, and welcome to episode 30 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Thanks for your patience the last couple of weeks as I've been tidying up the last couple of things I needed to do over the summer. While I was away, I was finishing up my new book, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, for Pen and Sword History. That's going to be coming out in the UK September 30th. It's going to be coming out in Canada December 19th, and it will be coming out in the United States January 2nd. So that's one of the things I was doing. And the other thing was actually taking a vacation. It's strange, I know, but some of us actually need to have a rest every once in a while. So thanks for your patience while I did that. I hope you've also had a chance to have a vacation this summer and that it was a good one. So coming back to the medieval podcast, it's going to be me for probably the next couple of weeks and then we'll be getting back to the interviews, which I love and I hope you love too. So today, coming back into it, I thought we would talk about one of the most famous manuscripts in the world, and that is the Beowulf manuscript. Because I think that while a lot of us know about Beowulf, we may not necessarily know much about the actual manuscript itself. Why is it important? Uh, What does it involve? All that kind of stuff. So let's talk about the Beowulf manuscript today. So the Beowulf manuscript is called that normally because it is the only manuscript in the world that has a copy of this poem. So the poem of Beowulf only exists in one copy in the entire world. And that's why this manuscript is called that. But it actually has another name, which is official, which is Cotton Vitalius A15. And I'll get to why it was called that in a minute. So Cotton Vitalius A15 is a fairly small manuscript. The parchment within it is only about seven inches tall and four inches wide. And it's kept in the British Library right now. And it's one of the manuscripts that came to uh, the world from the Cotton Collection. So let's talk about the Cotton Collection for a minute, because if you don't know about the Cotton Collection, it is important to know if you love medieval stuff. So Sir Robert Cotton was a member of the Uh, English aristocracy who lived in the early 17th century. So he's really contemporary with Shakespeare in that he lived from 1571 to 1631. And while he was growing up, he was already collecting all sorts of things like Roman inscriptions and medieval coins and manuscripts. And he was, we know he was collecting these things before the age of 18. So he was already really into history. And for that, we are all super grateful So he collected manuscripts and books uh, over the course of his life. And the Cotton Collection, when it was donated to the English people or the British people, contained more than 1,400 manuscripts and 1,500 charters, rolls, and seals. So that's quite a lot of stuff being collected. And it is the biggest collection of Anglo-Saxon literature in the world. So it's actually a very, very special collection. So Cotton Vitalius A15, the Beowulf manuscript, contains two codices in it that were bound together by Robert Cotton. One is the Southwark Codex, which was written, copied out in the late 12th century. And one is the Noel Codex, which was written in the late 10th or early 11th century, so around the year 1000. And that section is the one that has Beowulf in it. It's named after Lawrence Noel who was the last person who owned it before Robert Cotton acquired it and bound it together with the Southwark Codex. Robert Cotton was collecting all sorts of these really interesting manuscripts and seals and coins and stuff, and it got passed down to his son and then his grandson. His grandson was named Sir John Cotton, and he bequeathed that whole collection in 1701 for the use of the public to the British government. And so this was one of the... Uh, the British Library will tell you it was one of the foundational collections when the British Museum was established in 1753. So this is a very, very important collection. Robert Cotton was uh, an advisor to James I of England, James VI of Scotland. He collected all sorts of really great stuff, so not just Anglo-Saxon manuscripts, but he collected manuscripts from John Dee, who was a very important person, advisor to Elizabeth I, and William Cecil, who was another really important advisor to uh, Elizabeth I. So there are these manuscripts in it as well. The collection also has Mary Queen of Scots' Will, the Lindisfarne Gospels, and two of the four copies of Magna Carta that were contemporary in 1250. So Robert Cotton was really generous in letting people use his library, at least his friends, and he 
actually loaned out books as you do when you have all sorts of awesome books. Some of them never came back. So one of the ones that was known to be part of the cotton collection never came back was the Utrecht Psalter. So there are bits of the cotton collection that have been dispersed as well. But Robert Cotton also was very generous with his collection. Um, One of the donations that he gave was around a dozen volumes and that he gave to Sir Thomas Bodley. And these were some of the first manuscripts to make up the Bodleian Library at Oxford. So Robert Cotton was hugely influential. Without him, we wouldn't have a whole bunch of the books that we have now that are available to us as the public. So that is really thanks to the Cotton family. So we are really, really grateful to him. And in Robert Cotton's library, he had his books stored in book presses. And on top of each of these book presses were busts of the 12 Caesars and two imperial ladies. So when you look at the name Cotton Vitalius A15, that's a shelf mark. So that means that this manuscript came from the Cotton Collection, from the book press that had a bust of Vitalius on the top, shelf A number 15. So we call it the Beowulf Manuscript because that's a little bit shorter. But it's actually, it was on a shelf with a bust of Vitalius on the top. When the cotton collection was given to the British people, it was stored for a time in Ashburnham House in Westminster. Um, And this is actually really a, a pivotal moment for this collection because in 1731, October 23rd, a fire broke out at Ashburnham House and started to burn all these valuable manuscripts, including, you know, our single copy of Beowulf in the world. And so many of these manuscripts were saved by being actually thrown out the window. So without people going in and actually shoveling out all these amazing manuscripts and books, Beowulf would not necessarily be known to us today. So if you look at the Beowulf manuscript, you will see it's got smoke damage on it. And that's from this dramatic rescue that happened October 23rd, 1731, when Ashburnham House caught fire. So kudos to all of those people who were in that burning building tossing manuscripts out. We are so grateful to you now here in 2019. Thank you for your heroic efforts. So I was talking about the Beowulf manuscript having smoke damage, and that's what it looks like when you look at it. And you can actually look at the Beowulf manuscript online. You can see it on the British Library website, which is awesome. They've totally scanned the whole thing, which makes it very, very easy to see, and you can zoom in. And you'll see when you look at it, it's not a very beautiful manuscript. It has the smoke damage, like I told you. But beyond that, before, when it was actually being put together, it was not a real luxury manuscript. So if you look at it closely, and these are the type of details that you'd see if you're a scholar like Eric Fackel, who I talked to in January, we can go back and listen to his podcast and you'll see how all the details of the manuscript really tell its story. But if you look at the Beowulf manuscript specifically, You can see there are holes in the parchment, uh, which the scribes have written around, which means that those holes were there when they got the parchment. They weren't something that happened through damage later. So that means that that parchment wasn't necessarily the best quality when they got it. And another clue as to whether this was good quality parchment or not, and it's not, you can look at, by zooming in on the manuscript itself, you can see little speckles of black. And those speckles of black are not ink spots. Those are actually little bits of stubble from the original owner of the parchment, the animal whose skin it was. When they made parchment and scraped off uh, the hair of the parchment, it sometimes left behind little bits of stubble. And you can actually see this in the Beowulf manuscript, which again shows that it wasn't the best parchment that was being used. There are illustrations in the Beowulf manuscript and they are of fantastic beasts. So it's really worth looking at. We'll get into what kind of beasts were talked about in this manuscript, but you can see them and the miniatures are kind of not the best. They're not drawn as meticulously as other miniatures are. They're usually done in just a couple of colors and there is definitely no gold leaf on them. So you can see this is again, uh, kind of, relatively low budget manuscript. You can also see things like stains, which could be later. You can see erasures that the scribe has written around again. So those are probably contemporary while the scribe is writing. They were scraping off some things that they didn't want to have there. You can also see faint 
pencil lines. So when the actual poem of Beowulf starts, if you look at that first page and you zoom in, you can see the pencil lines that the scribe was using to make sure that his writing was on the level. And that's actually something I think is super cool to see when you see the process in process. And then you can see again on this first page of the poem of Beowulf, you can see someone has written over top of the letters a gloss and that in these cases is a translation of the Old English. So a couple of words translated. So you can see as someone was going through, they wrote in really faint pencil what this word meant as they were translating it for themselves. And again, this is a really cool bit of history that you can see right on the manuscript itself. And then finally, there are pages missing. So the actual poem of Beowulf starts with the story of Beowulf versus Grendel and Grendel's mother. And then there seems to be a whole bunch missing. And then it comes back to Beowulf and the story of the dragon and the cup. And so not only the poem of Beowulf, but St. Christopher as well in this manuscript and the story of Judith, they're missing bits. And it's hard to say with a thousand year old manuscript when those bits went missing, but it kind of goes to show that this is a manuscript that's seen a lot of trouble. It was never meant to be a real display copy to begin with, at least not in terms of the kind that you'd give to a king, for example. And then it's had a hard life. So it's a really interesting manuscript to look at in that regard. You can see all the adventures that it's gone through actually written on the pages, which I think is something special. So again, the Noel Codex, which is the kind of second half of Cotton Vitalius A15, we call it the Beowulf manuscript, but within it, it's actually got five different texts. The first one is the story of St. Christopher. Uh, the second one is something called the Wonders of the East or the Marvels of the East. The third is the letter of Alexander to Aristotle, which is meant to be a letter written by Alexander the Great to his teacher, Aristotle. Then there's Beowulf, and then there's the biblical story of Judith. So all of these are within the manuscript itself. And this is actually written by only two scribes, which is another interesting facet of the manuscript. And you kind of wonder what unifies these things. So one of the five minute medievalist articles I wrote about, which you can find on medievalist.net, talks about most medieval manuscripts are not just a single text. So you don't just, for example, pick up like a paperback copy of Beowulf. They are compilations of several different stories or texts or prayers or histories that are bound together. And I think of it kind of like a mixtape. So when you look at a mixtape or when you look at a medieval miscellany like this, you try and look at what are the common threads that show the taste of the person who had this commissioned, who had this made. And what's really interesting about the Beowulf manuscript is that all of these stories, with perhaps the exception of Judith, are about monsters. Now, it seems kind of weird to say, St. Christopher is a story of a monster, but we'll get to that in a second. So St. Christopher, the wonders or marvels of the East, letter of Alexander, Beowulf, all of these have to do with monsters. And perhaps you could think, you know, if you think kind of outside the box, think of Judith being the story of a monster because she does behead a king and that's pretty fierce. But the other ones have to do with monsters. So when I talk about St. Christopher being the story of a monster, what on earth am I talking about? Because when you see a lot of Christian art uh, or medals of St. Christopher, for example, it's St. Christopher, the Christ bearer, right? You'll see an image of a saint with a boy on his back. And that boy turns out to have been Jesus, who uh, was carried across a river by St. Christopher. Now, that is not the story of St. Christopher that was told back in the Middle Ages, Back in the Middle Ages, St. Christopher was actually a monster. He was a member of a race from the East called uh, Kinesphalus. People probably say that differently. Kinesphalus, perhaps, but it is a dog-headed man. So a very, very big, uh, gigantic man with the head of a dog, usually long, long locks, they say long hair and eyes like lamps and also very sharp teeth. So this old English story of St. Christopher follows that tradition. So I'll give you a quick rundown on the story of St. Christopher in this old English version. So St. Christopher's story follows a very, very traditional medieval story of sainthood in that he is Somebody who believes in God and is tortured by an emperor 
um, for his beliefs. And it, the story ends in, in mass conversions, but it doesn't end happily for the saint. So in this case, Christopher is a dog-headed man um, from the, somewhere in the East. And he learns about Christianity. He wants to become a Christian, but he's one of these, this race of dog heads that cannot speak like a man. And so he prays uh, to be given speech. Now, this is in a version that is not in the Beowulf manuscript. This part of the story is cut off in the Beowulf manuscript. And it picks up when Christopher is encountering an emperor and saying, all of your people should believe in God, should believe in Jesus. This is the one way to reach salvation. So, of course, he comes up against an emperor called Dagnus, who refuses to convert or let his people convert. He tortures Christopher by having him beaten with rods first, then by having him placed on a metal table with a fire underneath to burn him. And of course, Christopher is untouched by the flames. He's, he's fine. He stands up in the middle of it and his face is like roses. And then Dagnus sees this isn't working. So he, he has his warriors spend all day, morning till night, shooting Christopher with arrows. And then he goes to inspect Christopher's body and sees that the arrows haven't actually hurt Christopher. And he gets in Christopher's face about this. And two of the arrows turn around and they blind Dagnus. Then Christopher says, I know that I'll be martyred tomorrow morning, but when I am, take some of the blood from my martyrdom, mix it with some of the mud where I fall, and put this on your eyes and God will heal your eyes. So the next day comes and Christopher is about to be martyred and he appeals to God and, you know, says, all of this is in your name. I'm, I'm doing this for your glory. And a voice comes down from heaven saying, Christopher, I've heard you. And whoever prays in your name will be heard by me. They will get what they want. And so sure enough, Christopher is martyred. He's killed. His blood spills on the ground. A whole bunch of people who have heard this heavenly voice have already converted to Christianity, which is amazing. And then Dagnus takes some of this blood, mixes it with the mud, puts it on his eyes and invokes Christopher. And he is cured. He's able to see. And so because of this miracle, uh, Dagnus has the rest of his realm convert and everyone becomes Christian. And at the end of the story, Christopher asks that anyone who reads his story or hears his story, reads it with tears, that they will be blessed as well. For me, the story of St. Christopher, this medieval version, is really exciting because it's a story of monstrosity, uh, salvation, when you are definitely, definitely not one of the you know, quote unquote, normal people within society. And it's really, really fascinating. It speaks to medieval people's fascination with monsters and especially a kind of werewolf monster. So for me, the story of St. Christopher is a really exciting one. And this is why it's, it's an interesting part of this collection within this manuscript because these dog-headed people are talked about elsewhere within the manuscript. So the story of St. Christopher is the first one in the Beowulf manuscript and after that is the marvels of the east or the wonders of the east and I've written about this for medievalist.net because it is an exciting exciting compilation of what you will find if you travel to the east and much of it is of course fantastic and much of it is this kind of wonder of medieval understatement so I thought instead of just telling you about this book I'm going to read to you some of the some of the sections in it that I find super interesting there are a lot of kind of consistencies in these um, strange and marvelous creatures that you find if you travel to the edges of the world. Uh, many times they have glowing eyes. A lot of times they burst into flames. Many times they run away from you if you come up to them. And so that's why they're so elusive. That's why people don't see them very much. So here's a little bit from the Wonders of the East. As you go toward the Red Sea, there is a place called Lentibilcinia, where there are hands born like ours, red in color. If anyone tries to take or touch them, they immediately burn up all his body. That is extraordinary magic. Wild beasts are also born there. When these wild beasts hear a human voice, they run quickly. The beasts have eight feet and Valkyrie eyes and two heads, and if anyone tries to touch them, they set their bodies aflame. They are extraordinary beasts. And here's one that, that kind of gets at the St. Christopher thing. Also, there are born there half-dogs who are called conopeni. 
They have horses' manes and boars' tusks and dogs' heads, and their breath is like a fiery flame. These lands are near the cities, which are filled with all the worldly wealth, that is, in the south of Egypt. And then there's the ones that kind of tell you about why some things are so valuable. Um, I've written about pepper before. I want to get to pepper in a second, but here's one about gold. The river is named Capi in the same place, which is called Gargonius, that is Valkyrie-like. Ants are born there as big as dogs, which have feet like grasshoppers and are of red and black color. The ants dig up gold from the ground from before night to the fifth hour of the day. People who are bold enough to take the gold bring with them male camels and females with their young. They tie up the young before they cross the river. They load the gold onto the females and mount them themselves and leave the males there. Then the ants detect the males, and while the ants are occupied with the males, the men cross over the river with the females and the gold. They are so swift that one would think they were flying. So obviously, gold is really worth a lot because you have to sacrifice a whole bunch of camels to ants to get the gold. So obviously, it's expensive stuff. So here's the one about the pepper from The Wonders of the East or The Marvels of the East. In one land there are born donkeys which have horns as big as oxen. They are in that very great wasteland which is in the southern part of Babylonia. They retreat to the Red Sea because of the multitude of snakes called Corsii which are in those places. They have horns as big as rams. If they strike or touch anyone, he immediately dies. In those lands there is an abundance of pepper. The snakes keep the pepper in their eagerness. In order to take the pepper, people set fire to the place and then the snakes flee down into the earth. Because of this, the pepper is black. There, now you know, that is why pepper is black. So the wonders of the East or the marvels of the East is a kind of travel literature that tells you all about all sorts of the things that you would find if you do travel. And many of the things, like I said, are marvelous. There are all sorts of beasts and strange looking humans. Some have no heads, but they have faces in their chests. Um, some of them have only one big foot and that uses that <laughs> covers them as a as shade during the day in the desert, that kind of thing. It does mention Ethiopians as well, which is interesting. You'll see if you look at it that this is one of kind of the least noteworthy examples that you find in the wonders of the East because it's not all that strange to them. People, they have black skin, they're called Ethiopians, moving on to the next thing. And so... That's kind of interesting that you find it in the Wonders of the East or the Marvels of the East, but it's not particularly noteworthy for the people who are writing it. So next up in the Beowulf manuscript, you have the letter of Alexander to Aristotle. So again, this is meant to be written by Alexander the Great, um, written to Aristotle. It is definitely not written by Alexander the Great <laughs> to Aristotle, but it's a really kind of exciting adventure story anyway. So... Alexander is writing this, he says, to tell Aristotle about all of the things he's seen, the places he's conquered, the gold that he's plundered, and it's basically kind of a way of showing what a great warrior Alexander was as well. Now, if you read this, you can kind of decide for yourself whether he's a great man or not. <laughs> it's questionable at times, but it is a kind of exciting adventure story as well, because Alexander will go through saying, and then I went to Persia, and I conquered these people and I got this much plunder and then I went to India and I conquered these people and I got this much plunder but he tells you a little bit about how the battles went what kind of provisions he had all of this is hugely exaggerated but it talks about the kind of plunder that he got from there and this doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the real Alexander but it does tell you about what people in medieval Europe thought was exotic and what they thought was exciting, and what they were curious about. And so it's kind of more valuable for that kind of thing. So on his campaign, Alexander has all sorts of animals with him, including elephants, which is very exciting. And he travels, and he gets local guides to show him the way. And there are all sorts of perilous animals that he comes across as well, and some of them are recognizable as a hippopotamus, for example, a whole bunch of hippopotami that devour his people and take them down the river and a rhinoceros that they have to throw spears at and they have giant insects and giant bats and giant snakes that they have to contend with and it's very much 
kind of like if you saw the Peter Jackson version of King Kong where they have all sorts of really huge and exotic creatures that they have to fight off. It's very much like that. And so it's, it's exciting in the same way where it tells you about what people found exciting and interesting at the time. Alexander is not a particularly nice guy in that any time that he's led into danger, he kills off a bunch of the guides for leading him into danger, feeds them to the animals. But it's a it's kind of a well-written story in that there is some suspense, right? Alexander and his army is camped out and there's campfires and in the dark there are all sorts of creatures that are going to attack their camp. And in that way, it's kind of creepy in the way that Beowulf is creepy as well, where you have suspense, you have monsters, you don't know what's going to happen next to our heroes as they are sitting in the dark. So the letter of Alexander deals with a lot of the same sort of monsters that you find in the Wonders of the East or the mar Marvels of the East. So it connects back to St. Christopher in that way, sort of monstrous stuff from the East. Also, Wonders of the East, that kind of monster story. And then again, Alexander and his company in the dark, waiting to be attacked by monsters, kind of foreshadows what you're going to see in Beowulf next. So Beowulf is the next story that you come across as you go kind of through this manuscript page by page. And again, it's the story, you probably already know it, of Beowulf is, is asked to take care of this problem. There is a monster that is attacking a mead hall at night, carrying people off and devouring them. And Beowulf is asked to go and take care of the problem, and he does. Then there is a big section of the poem that seems to be missing. And then Beowulf has to deal with the dragon later on. Then, finally, uh, Judith is the last section of this manuscript. There has been some speculation that Judith was not meant to originally be the end of the manuscript, possibly the beginning, possibly paired with St. Christopher, which would kind of make sense. And if you think of it kind of talking about Judith into Christopher transitioning into monsters, that would be kind of an awesome layout for the story. You'd want to go and look at more Beowulf scholars' thoughts on that rather than mine. But the fact that there is kind of this consistency in monstrous stories in this manuscript is actually really, really fascinating. So if you're interested in the Beowulf manuscript, don't let it be just for this one poem. Now, I'm not going to discount it. Beowulf is a great story, and the fact that it exists, that it survived the fire, that it exists in one manuscript, which is so precious to us, is definitely worth taking a look at. But when you look at it in the wider context of what else is in the Beowulf manuscript, it becomes even more interesting. And when I took a course on Beowulf in university, um, and I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it was with uh, Sarah Lorat Kiefer. She pointed out to me, to our class, that there are many parts in the Beowulf manuscript in which it's not necessarily clear from the pronouns who is doing what during the fights between Beowulf and Grendel. And it kind of blurs this line between humans and monsters. And again, if you bring that back to St. Christopher, it's actually kind of really exciting when you think about monsters and subjectivity. Who is the monster? but maybe that's too much literary criticism for one podcast. So I thought I would bring the Beowulf manuscript to you, tell you a little bit about Cotton Vitalius A15, a little bit about Sir Robert Cotton, because it's an important story for people who are interested, not only in medieval manuscripts, but especially in Anglo-Saxon manuscripts. Without the Cottons, without their preservation, we would not have Beowulf uh, or many of the other ones. So it's a good story to know. I'm happy to be back with you doing a podcast again, and I hope you enjoyed this kind of brief look at Beowulf. The translation I used of The Wonders of the East comes from Dr. Andy Orchard's Pride and Prodigies, Studies in the Monsters of the Beowulf Manuscript. And you can find a translation of the Cotton Vitalius A15, or Noah Codex, Life of St. Christopher, on Dr. Aaron K. Hostetter's Anglo-Saxon Narrative Poetry Project at anglosaxonpoetry.camden.com dot rutgers dot edu slash saint hyphen christopher before we go here's peter from medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website what's up peter hi danielle it's been a bit of a quiet week here at medievalist.net in part because we've all been at the cottage but uh we did have some news to kind of report uh so you can read about 
deliberately altered skulls from early medieval Croatia, a buried warrior in Prague, and how Ireland's population declined in the, middle, in the early Middle Ages, and it wasn't caused by the Vikings. So all that on our site this week. That sounds really good. And we have some really good news as well. A big, giant announcement. Right, Peter? Woohoo! Yes, we do. Yes, we have started a Book of the Month Club. So we've partnered with Boydell and Brewer, and they're one of the kind of leading uh, publishers about medieval studies. And so they're going to be writing a, a book for, for every month uh, for like kind of people that sign up through our Patreon. Uh, and so if you kind of sign up at the $35 level and half of that would go to us and half of this goes to Boydell, uh, you will get a book each month for them. And this is for only only for our UK and US audience. Uh, we'll hopefully get the rest of the world soon. And the first book is called uh, The Sutton Who Story by uh, Martin Carver. And it's the, the story of one of the great archaeological finds from Anglo-Saxon England. So if you sign up by the end of August, uh, you'll actually get that in September and uh, we'll have some kind of fun with that uh, creating a little book club for you for you all yeah it's gonna be super exciting so if you sign up for that level of our patreon on patreon.com slash medievalists then you will get a book every month and then we'll talk about it on I think it's gonna be a google hangout we will let you know every month and I'll read it and Peter will read it and we will talk to you about it's gonna be awesome so we were talking about Anglo-Saxons this week talking about the Beowulf manuscript so it's awesome to have the Sutton Who story as our first book, but we only have a couple more days to sign up for that one before we're on to the next book. So if you have to sign up by the end of August, right? Yes, yes. You have to sign up by August 31st. It'll get deducted out of your account through PayPal or however you sign it up on September 1st. Uh, And then Boydell will ship off the book to you within a few days. So uh, we hope this is going to something that kind of grows. And uh, we really are looking forward to uh, talking to you all about these books. It's going to be awesome. So it's not always going to be Anglo-Saxons, right? It's going to be all over the place, different books. Yeah, yeah. The, the next book will be dealing with the Bayou Tapestry, but like Boydell and Brewer has like a vast collection of uh, various books all about the for, throughout the Middle Ages. So we're working with them to kind of figure out picking up uh, some of the best books and to kind of share with you all. So get on Patreon, patreon.com slash medievalists, and you can be part of our book club if you sign up before the end of August. You can talk to us at the end of September about the Sutton Who story. And if you sign up in September, then you can start on the Bayou Tapestry book, which will come to you a bit later. And we will talk about that at the end of October. So I'm super excited about this book club. Are you excited, Peter? I am excited. Woo! It's going to be awesome. Okay, thanks, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> For all things medieval, from the Anglo-Saxons to Al-Andalus, check out Medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can also follow me, Danielle Sabalski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including pre-ordering the one I just finished, on Amazon. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening. Have yourself an awesome day.